You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who've been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hi Stella. Hi Sasha. How's life in America? Ah, life as well. The weather is getting beautiful here in Arizona. How about how about there in Ireland? It's getting wintry, it's getting autumnal. Uh, mm. It's kind of a beautiful season, season, but feeling like we're starting to light the fires and stuff. Very different oh, yeah. from Arizona, I'd imagine. <laughs> well, you know, the desert gets, the, the temperature ranges are pretty big. So during the day when it's warm, it could be in the 80s. But at night, it does get down to the 50s or so. So we might we might sit outside by the fire one of these days. <laughs> So um, today's episode is going to discuss what happens when a family has a gender dysphoric teenager or child and the parents don't agree on how to handle it. Do you see this a lot? I do see this a lot and I see this really, really impacting families in in such a terrible, harrowing way. Sometimes these are very loving families who don't agree. And that mm-hmm. can cause a huge, extraordinary wound to a, a very trusting relationship. And I often wonder to myself, you know, that's that. I wouldn't say a terminal wound, even though it can be, but it's a deep wound when you think, you know, we're 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 together raising these kids, and we don't agree on such an important point. And there's layers, and we'll get into that during the episode. But I also see it in the larger scale when parents have split up. And they don't agree. And that is it's just so damaging. And especially for the kid, the kids gets lost as the parents often kind of trying to kind of one, sort out a conflict between you and the other parent. And two, remember that the the child is the center of the of the problem. Do you see it much? I, I do. And I mean, it's it's really hard because what ends up happening is there's usually one parent who believes that the proper way to deal with the the issue is to lean in with a lot of structure and to almost be interventionist in a way. And then if the other parent wants to take a much more relaxed approach, the parent who wants to intervene feels like they're going crazy because, you know, they would like to do more strategizing and more planning and be a little bit more mindful with decisions they make. And of course, the parent who takes that relaxed approach is making them feel like they don't really have a partner. They don't have someone who's got their back. So this is a very difficult place to be for the parent that wants to be a little bit more structured. Yeah. And this happens again and again and again in parenting where um, and like as as a co-parent, as as somebody who has kids and with my husband, when we disagree on something big, it's like we look at each other. It's like, right, we have a problem. It's really, really, really difficult. And, um, you know, the parent who isn't structured and who kind of wants to hope for the best, sometimes they just think, let it play out. Let mm-hmm. it play out. And honestly, the kid, they say things, in my experience, the, that parent tends to say things like, you know, they're a good kid. They're a savvy kid. They'll work it out. They're just in trouble. They'll work it out. And um, part of me uh, instinctively, you know, I did write Cottonwell Kids and it was very low interventionist as a, as a book. And it was saying that in that high intervention parenting can can cause a lot of distress. So my 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 philosophy lies with the non-interventionist parent. And mm-hmm. yet I think the stakes are so high in this context, I listen very acutely to the interventionist parent in this context. And so I myself feel quite conflicted yeah. in this. Yeah. I feel the same way. And it really depends on each family and, you know, the kind of driving factors behind each parent's stance. I mean, I think sometimes the relaxed parent 
is actually coming from a strategic place where maybe they know their kid very well and they think, you know, let's lean in with love and spend time together and do stuff, but let's not harp on the gender constantly. And I think I would agree with that perspective. But then sometimes the relaxed parent is coming more from a place of, I can't be bothered to even consider this issue. I don't want to think about it. This freaks me out. And I'd rather kind of close my eyes and pretend it's not happening and just cross my fingers. Yeah. And I don't think that's the right approach. So and uh, either that parent who says I can't be, but they're not quite saying I can't be bothered. It's more like I am so freaked out. This cannot mm. be happening. I can't breathe at the idea of this happening. So I'm going to do as, as Sasha says, close my eyes and look the other way because it's just kind of almost un, unconscionable that this could be happening. And so they literally think because I can't envisage this happening, I am going to presume this won't happen. Yeah. And it takes a very brave parent who'd be the opposite parent saying, I think it could happen. It takes an mm. awful lot of bravery. You know what? You know, was it Nietzsche who said, look at the monster under the rug? You know what I mean? Like sometimes it takes a lot of guts to say, well, actually, this could happen. And yeah. it's it's kind of fine to click your heels and close your eyes and hope for the best. But when the stakes are high, is it? And mm-hmm. I think that's the real, sorry, I jumped in on you, but I think that's the real fear with those parents who are closing their eyes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking about how much the parental perspective is informed by what research they're doing. You know, when when I consult with families who have been mostly reading the kind of affirmative approach perspective, they usually come to the table with a lot of fears that their kid is going to harm themselves and a a sense that their child is very fragile. And sometimes the, I don't want to call it the relaxed parent, because in this case, it's not quite that. But sometimes there's one parent who's saying, I'm so afraid of um, distressing my child. I'm afraid of um, breaking our bond that I would like to let the child lead the way because I believe at this moment that this is how to prevent disaster. Yeah. And sometimes the other parent has been reading more, um, you know, the perspectives of, of therapists, like maybe like ourselves who are like, no, you know, actually your kid might be going through a kind of identity crisis and they're more resilient than you think. And actually you need to lean in with love and do set boundaries and do those things. And that parent is thinking, you know, I don't want to be afraid of my child losing their mental well-being and therefore put them down a path that isn't actually good in the long run. So there are so many different reasons that parents might approach this differently. And it's not only, of course, as we mentioned before, you know, just out of Um, not wanting to think about it or the fear or the overwhelm. Sometimes parents are reading materials, which makes them think we have to capitulate to everything the child wants or else either the child will stop trusting us and it will deteriorate all of the bond that we have, or the child is going to be so upset and so hurt that they will be suicidal. Yeah. And, and it's, I see it a lot because I see, you know, other contexts, not just gender. I see teenagers who are really in trouble and I see the parents often disagreeing and it can really rip up the stre- the, the bond within the marriage where one is saying A and the other is saying B. And it's a strategy. It's a strategy. It's almost like the house is on fire. My child is in the house and one is saying, go in the front door and go straight up and save them. The other is saying, no, 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 no. Come around the back. Bring them out the window. You can't go in that front door. If you go in the front door, the wind will get it. The smoke will come in. It's not. It's the worst thing to do. And it Mm. feels as heightened as that. It really Mm -hmm. does. And Mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult for people in our position, Sasha, is that we don't have a quality evidence base. We just have psychological insight and our training, but we don't. Nobody has cracked well, nobody has cracked any nut to do with the human condition, really. We have kind of, we have, you know, we have our training. We have, we have kind of good, good analysis of what could happen. But, you know, humans never fail to surprise. And yeah. this feels really fraught. And, you know, you might have the likes of me or you saying one thing, one parent saying another, and the third, the second, you know, the third adult in this kind of triangle saying something completely different. 
And then there's a child in the middle of it all. And that it's it's frightening, really, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, what, what I'm thinking about is um, how universal this is. You know, you mentioned that in so many kinds of parenting decisions, it's very normal for mom and dad or mom and mom and dad and dad to disagree on exactly what the right steps are. So maybe can you talk a little bit more about that just to help... I guess, yeah. demystify, de-exceptionalize this yeah. challenge. Yeah. Like I've seen over the years so often, like parents of uh, children with anorexia and the mother wants to weigh them. She wants to check their food. She wants uh, the kid to kind of send her texts about what food she's eating in, cl- in, in school. She wants to have her downstairs eating. And maybe the father, now these are generalizations, but I've seen it often. The father saying, let it go. Just take the pressure off. Take the pressure off and she, she'll she come around. She'll come around. And the mother's like, we can't afford to. She's getting dangerously skinny. We cannot do that. And that's almost schizophrenic. You've got such two extraordinarily different. So when dad's home, it's a free for all. I can do what I want. When mom's home, it's it's a kind of a military and um, so there's no balance. There's no kind of level of safe harbor at home because it's either one extreme or the other. And then sadly, and it's very understandable, and I am the parent, so I, I get it. I, I would be more interventionist compared to my incredibly low interventionist husband. <laughs> but we're both quite low interventionist as, as a style. But what would happen is you start, you start reacting so if they go non-interventionist, you go extremely interventionist to counteract their, in your mind, their uselessness. And so then parents are getting, <laughs> yeah, parents are getting, this is so understandable. Honestly, if you're in the middle of it, it is so understandable and justifiable because when you're in the middle of it, you're like, I have to. I've been away for three days working. It's been an absolute mess. I now had to bring some structure in there. Sasha said, lean in with love and structure and by God, I with it. <laughs> and in they'll go, like, and they mightn't say, so I should said, but you follow me. They know what they're doing. They've read up. They know what their plan is. And they come in very strong. And it causes absolute mayhem in the family environment. There's tension. Nobody is on the same sheet. Nobody is agreeing. And everybody's feeling at sea and scared and unhappy with everybody else. And it's exactly wrong. And it's very hard to get out of because we are talking, like you said so well just there a few minutes ago, we're talking about two different strategies, really. And it's like, we really, really, really care. And we're going in on two different levels here. Now, what do you do? Where do Mm -hmm. you go with that? Because we've agreed on everything else. Yeah. And what, what often happens with the kid is that this creates a kind of a magnetism towards the parent that is being more chill. And that's Often, in my experience, um, it, it, the mothers usually do tend to be more interventionist in my experience. Me too. Not always, but usually it is. And so uh, Enough that you could quite heavily remark upon yeah. it, in fairness. Like, and may I say, yeah. just, to, just to intervene, as I always do, but in the GDSN <laughs> meetings, 90 to 95% are women. Yeah. So yeah. they're the meetings for the parents and they're women, women, women yeah. coming in. Yeah. But yeah. keep going. Yeah. And so what what ends up happening, especially because at least on my end, out of the families I've consulted with, we're looking at about 80 percent are girls with dysphoria and about 20 percent boys. So we're talking primarily mother daughter relationships. And from a developmental perspective, it's very normal during the adolescent years for mothers and daughters to begin to clash. And so when you have dad playing good cop and mom playing bad cop, and you're a daughter who's trying to find your own identity separate from mom, and you're like, screw womanhood. It is a perfect recipe to really disengage from your mom, and there to be a lot of conflict between daughter and mom. And, um, you know, I think, like, in general, the ideal is for parents to be a team and to be on the same page, strategizing together. Maybe they, even within that... Um, kind of strategy, maybe they create a little space for good cop, bad cop, right? So if that's happening from a more like mindful, conscientious, deliberate place, I think that's fine. They might notice, like, I think when things are working well, a family might notice, you know, 
Whenever she talks to dad, she's less defensive. She's a little more open. So let dad do the gender conversations and let mom focus more on just spending quality time, rebuilding the bond. Mom's not allowed to talk gender, okay? So if that's what's happening and it's deliberate, it's fine. But if all of this is kind of um, just haphazardly unfolding, you end up in a situation where mom is not only being pushed away by the daughter, but she's becoming even more paranoid because she feels like she has no control. So it can really um, amp up what you were talking about earlier, where if dad is being relaxed, mom's trying to overcompensate. And if she is also feeling quite disconnected from her daughter, if there's a lot of tension there, it can really exacerbate that feeling of helplessness that the mom might feel. So it's just, it's very, very tricky. And that's why I always tell parents being on the same page or at least working to get closer to the same page is very important. And for families who aren't there, it's, it's such a tough spot. And if you aren't on the same page, there has to be some sort of meeting of minds, if at all possible, where you say we're not on the same page page however let's do a or let's you know let's let's meet on some level at some point because really it's just such a a mess if we if we don't agree on anything let's come to some sort of compromises and let's have regular meetings regular chats rather than this silence warfare of your way my way silently because that, mm-hmm. that really doesn't work out. On the strategizing of the good cop, bad cop, I've seen it work very well in the GDSN, the Gender Dysphoria Support Network. We've had meetings of parents of desisters. And some of the, so these are parents of children who've desisted. And they kind of meet in the fairs. They've had a really harrowing time because they feel that, you know, they feel they're on eggshells. They feel that the, the, the kids have desisted, but, and they're happy the kids have desisted and the kids are generally happy, but they really feel that they've been through a serious war really and uh, what was interesting was they started talking about the fathers and saying they they use the fathers to okay you can't deal with anything to do with gender you're closing your eyes and you're looking away however you are willing to drive many miles to bring them to that event do it (laughs) or you are willing to do this and so they kind of got them very much doing the the physical heavy lifting of events and stuff like that and I thought that seemed like a very good strategy it reminded me of when I first had my babies and my husband was like almost the butler like get me tea get me a scone (laughs) I'm breastfeeding the children (laughs) at all points you have to just help me and you know the the dads do it and you see that they kind of in they go like you know what I mean and so I saw that the, the way the parents of desisters were talking I thought isn't that an interesting common denominator of basically not asking the dad to engage in the gender because he couldn't, but asking them instead, will you bring her every Tuesday to hockey, even though that doesn't suit you or anybody? She needs it. You, It'll yeah. be good for you. It's a bit of light relief for both of you. Yeah. It has its place. So that's that's clever. That's standing back and saying, OK, you can't, mm-hmm. we can't meet on gender, but maybe we can meet in logistics. Yeah, and that's really highlighting the importance of just the relationship piece. I mean, sometimes I think parents get the the misconception that they have to sit down and talk to their kid about gender, like a, like a college lecturer and explain everything to their child when actually what needs to happen is at least in part, this isn't the whole pie, right? But at least in part regaining the connection because usually the kid has formed attachments to this gender thing that are much more powerful than their attachments to parents. And so dad getting in the car and chit chatting on the way to hockey every week or telling his daughter, Hey, put on your favorite band and talking about music. That is actually an incredibly important intervention. I am so glad you said that because there's a misconception that I feel I'm involved in and I don't want to be that the parents have heard me talking or you talking or us talking and they think we have all this knowledge and insight and by God, we're going to impart it to these unaccepting kids who do not want to hear it and the timing matters. 
And by God, they're going to hear it because these parents are going to bullet into them, whether they text it to them or PowerPoint it to them or email it to them or send them a YouTube. They are going to get that information. If they could actually just inject it into them when they're asleep, they would probably do it. And I understand as a natural enthusiast, I get it. I so get that desire of let me give you this information. It's vital you get it. But I just want to repeat timing matters. You, you miss the timing when you're given that information and you have missed it. Yeah. You've missed it. Yeah. And so it's so right. This college lecturer, I have all this information I want to impart it. It's a, it's a, it's a poison chalice because yes. you, you've got something amazing and you cannot deliver it in a wrong way. And it's very easy to blurt it out at the wrong time. And when we spoke with Helena uh, a few weeks ago and we talked about the kind of the she, she spoke about you know that context of what the parents can do and stuff like that it really felt like it really mattered if you came in at the wrong time when they yeah. were feeling so vulnerable and this is my moment mm-hmm. you could just feel like you've crushed a fragile little fledgling bird yes. trying to get out of the nest totally so so to to kind of lift up the perspective of the less interventionist parent here Sometimes if you're in doubt, the best thing to do is just try to bond, make them laugh, have yeah. fun, do something positive together. And I think that's very different from the parent who says, I don't recognize my kid anymore. I'm withdrawing. I can barely talk to her. We can barely be in the same room. That's very dangerous. So, yeah. I mean, that's if true. there's if there's a healthy way to put gender to the side and stay connected that's really what the best thing is to focus on. Yeah, there's a misconception that talking about gender is is the appropriate thing because, you know, when you say lean in with love and structure, you know, you're dead right. And it's not saying and conversation about gender because I'm not convinced conversation about gender is the most appropriate thing when the two, when people disagree. Yeah. Everything yeah. else can be kind of more appropriate than, than those conversations. Yeah. I think this will be really interesting to talk about when we discuss things like critical thinking or mind control or like strong, strong belief systems, because we know that there's a backfire effect, which we'll get into. We'll get into some, some of this into that series. But, but I want to, I want to think a little bit about the parents disagreeing here, because we've talked about some of the ways this can look when a family of course is still intact and maybe the families maybe the parents are kind of disagreeing or fighting about it or they're not quite on the same page but they're still working together somewhat as a family but this looks really different when there's cases of divorce or parents who have different households and the kid is spending one week one place and one week another place and the parents have very different approaches to this gender thing And this is even more complicated and really puts the kid in a very, in a difficult position, but also a way too powerful position when the parents aren't on the same page. And um, what I, what I have sometimes seen is that in one household, let's say there's a divorce and the mother and her new partner, her new husband or whatever agree that they need some structure and some boundaries and are trying to rein this in to some capacity. And then maybe the the biological father in a different household is letting the kid have completely free reign over names, pronouns, identification at school, presentation, and is not challenging the child at all. And so then the kid may, again, feel much more drawn to the lax parent, even though at least what I've seen, sometimes that lax parent in many other ways is actually not being a very conscientious parent. They're maybe too permissive and there's not a lot of boundary, not a lot of structure, and sometimes not even a lot of attention. So I know that's quite specific, but what what have you seen? I've seen it and I, I've seen exactly what you're describing, exactly. And I've seen it a few times. And what I've seen as well is the devastation of the bad cop in this scene, you know what I mean? The one who's bringing in Mm. the boundaries because they feel they have been kind of shafted out of the most important relationship of their life because uh, the other parent has taken the role of supposed good cop when actually it's another way for it is easy road and hard road. 
And, you know, one is taking the easy road, the other is taking the hard road. The hard road mother, or if they are a parent, it might be a father, they are uh, cast in a very difficult light. Society is, is denigrating them. And and they the, their their child is furious with them. They might even lose the relationship with the child. The whole time they're trying to just kind of keep some sort of hold, some sort of line as the kind of the medicalization of their child is happening in a very fast manner and it doesn't feel appropriate. It's a really harrowing, harrowing situation to be involved in. I do think this is where you really do have to lean in and you have to just kind of just try and have some sort of loving kind of scenario with with the child. And I say that with with such sympathy because I think and it's almost impossible because you're so aware that there's everything is happening in the other household and it's it's not right what's happening in the other household. I have seen this in other contexts, let's say with parents, let's say um, maybe the, the divorced parent and one parent allows the child to drink or take drugs or smoke weed and it's pretty party house over there at the weekend and then they come home to the kind of the, the uniform and the, you know what I mean, the clean up after you and... It's it's hard on everybody. Nobody's nobody's really benefiting from this. Really, it's it's just a, a horrible situation. Mm. You know, I hear you say that, and I'm gonna bring up something that I've really been trying to grapple with. This is almost more of like a philosophical, but also really practical issue. So we we are in a time in our culture now where the gender thing is like a Pandora's box, it's open, right? It's in, the, it's in the water. We can't really back out of it. And when there's a, let's say a divorced couple where one parent is actually um, allowing a medical transition and the other parent is just like drowning, just trying to hold back and buy some time. Um, when When do you think the parent who wants to wait, when do you think it's appropriate for them to say kind of like the cat is out of the bag? I just have to love my kid and go along with it, even though this is destructive or, or do they hold their ground and say on principle, even if I lose my child, even if the other parent somehow kind of estranges me because of this in the long run, I would know that I stood for the right thing. Like, at what point do you draw that line? It's so complicated. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not a parent. I work with lots of families, but I don't know what that would feel like. It must be absolute torture. But I just, I think sometimes I wonder about how valuable is it to rigidly hold on to something when the entire context we live in is going to make it impossible to stay connected? I don't, I don't, yeah. I can't answer that because every family has to decide for themselves. I'm the same as you. I've grappled with it and I haven't come up, I haven't come to a conclusion because on the one level, I think, you know what, you die alone. You're, you're a human, you're born alone and you die alone and you live your life and how you live is is according to to you if you follow me and it's very important that we we keep ourselves in the midst of 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 everything that happens i also think when you have a child you've got deep responsibility for the child and ultimately one could say and so therefore you always keep the relationship aflame as such you always you know keep that 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 light lit however if you look at anything to do with um, other kind of conditions, they would say that, that you do have to have boundaries and you do have to have honour yourself. And, you know, your, your, your feelings matter. And if something is happening that just you can't sit by, you, you something in you just, I think it depends on the person. No, no, no shit, Stella. But I really do think it depends, <laughs> depends on the person insofar as some people, they just think, I can't sit by and watch. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it in my own context many times over in another kind of life that I've had previous to this. And I've seen people grapple with, you know, deep alcoholism and, you know, fall into homelessness. And how do you deal with somebody who's who's fallen into homelessness and is is choosing drink and drugs over 
um, a healthy lifestyle. And if you bring them into the, the household, they will bring the drink and drugs into the household. And where do you draw your line? Because if you let them leave the household, they will go back into homelessness and they might die. And I've seen this happen and I've seen people die from homelessness in that context. And be very, very close to me. And so mm. I've I've kind of been at that coal face as as far as as far as you can go. I've been at that coal face. And um, so I know that you sometimes have to make very difficult decisions in life that other people will look at and think I could never have made that. I would just I would I would nod along. And I'm like, yeah, if you're in it, would you? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it really depends on the person, the context, the scenario. I would give a lot of space to everybody who makes their decision because there's some things none of us have to grapple with until you're right there and when you're right there you you just try to do the best you can you, you know there's a lot of you know when there's other siblings in the household where where do you go what do you do you've got to try and save something and you you know you do have to save yourself somewhere in the middle of it all it's so so hard because i'm thinking about I mean, you, you raised this point about, I think you've talked about it before in the podcast of like being really close to somebody who's living this very destructive life. But when you're talking about two parents and their child, the child is really the victim of the whole thing. Yeah. And I, I do wonder, like, if a parent is putting their foot down in such a strong way, that the child might mistakenly misunderstand yeah. that. And the child might interpret it because, you know, children do not understand the adult's moral dilemma at all. And if a child interprets it as, you know, mom would rather or dad would rather say no and lose our connection altogether because of this issue and carry that, kind of parent wound with them throughout their life. Like it, it's just, there's no, there's really no s- simple answer. It's just such a difficult thing to, to think because, about and to process. Yeah. And if you're, you're, if you're being asked, you know, to, to kind of sign some sort of consent for a mastectomy for your underage child or something like that, or to nod along to that, like, you know, that is harder than I think you or I can, can imagine and I, you know, if you if you don't agree with it, it is hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you fundamentally yeah. think this is the wrong thing, everybody is wrong and I'm the lone voice and I've I'm defeated. But I do think there might be wisdom somewhere along the way in saying I'm defeated and I'm going to keep the relationship. I was talking just so you know, in context, I was talking about when the child has become an adult then. There comes a time mm-hmm. when this child is an adult, there's other siblings. Mm-hmm. There does come a point where somewhere along the way you might have to make hard decisions around it. When the child is a child, you've got you've got your you've got your total responsibility. And sometimes you lose. You lose. And you just have to think, all I can do is gather what I can off this relationship. Which is so sad. Ah. Uh. I, 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 it's so sad. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about some of the um, court cases. So we've talked about families who stay together, maybe have disagreements about what to do. We've talked about families that are co-parenting, but disagree. And maybe there's some serious animosity there. Like it's, it's no surprise to any therapist who works with families that sometimes in divorce cases, children are used as pawns to act out the disdain between moms and dads. So this is, No surprise to me that these cases show up. And then you see on that next level, the court cases where there's a literal battle about puberty blockers or hormones or the child's gender identity. And this is just, to me, this is the saddest possible outcome. Yeah. And I often, I've met a few parents in this context where they're like, you know, the other parent never showed up for anything and now they can easily show their love with um, I'll sign off on the puberty blockers. I've done nothing for you for your first 13 years, but I can do this for you. And the injustice of that, it's, it's, it's almost beyond 
understanding, really, isn't it? It's it's so unfair. It's so profoundly unfair. What do you think are the psychological underpinnings of this dynamic? I mean, I could, I mean, we could obviously be generous to the parent who's signing off on puberty blockers and examine it that way. But if we were just to stick with this for a moment, I think there, there feels like a strain of narcissism in there um, of the parent who wants to be the hero, though they haven't really shown up in a heroic way before. Yeah. I don't know if you get yeah. that too, but you do get that, and you also get the kind of um, the the kind of infl- kind of grandiose, inflated, which is part of the narcissism of thinking, oh yeah, you 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 just need to be there for the big thing, the other stuff doesn't matter, and the other stuff really matters. You know what I mean? Oh my god, yeah. The parents kid themselves. Oh, I, I was I was there for that big thing, and that's what matters. And um, I I think it's very 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 difficult for the for the, the child within it, but also the parent. Imagine the level-headed, loving parent who's saying, yeah, and they're kind of talking to their device right now and say, but what do we do? And I suppose all they can do is try and um, kind of salvage their own relationship with their own child. In a way, if you're into a place where it's court cases and narcissism, all you've got left is trying to kind of keep a kind of golden thread between you and your child. I think you just have to allow the... I think just to keep yourself sane, you just have to allow mm-hmm. the, the other, the kind of the sideshow of what's going on in the other household to unfold because you've no, you've no power over it. But I, I yeah, can't see anything better to do. But what do you yeah, think? Yeah, that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier of like recognizing that this other household is going to be permissive and maybe even pushy of interventions you don't agree with. But all you have is your relationship with your child and doing your best with that. But let's let's say we are trying to be generous to the parent who's advocating for puberty yeah. blockers and interventions, right? Um, it's entirely possible that the parent who's restrictive maybe does have some kind of bias that is driving their perspective, or maybe they are um, trying to force a certain kind of gender conformity on the child. Like that's entirely possible. Uh, And not only that, it's entirely possible that that parent, the interventionist parent will often, you know, because none of us are, 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 are perfect. They will often have the controlling aspect to their personality. So the Mm. other parent, the lax parent could be saying, yeah, you've always been controlling and now you're trying to control this. And you don't realize that all that control has led to this. And you know what? There's an argument. There's an argument for everything to do with this. Yeah. And so that interventionist parent is that kind of thinking, well, it's Peter who cried wolf. Y- yeah, I was controlling about lots of other things. But this thing, this thing I need to be controlling over. And um, I, I can see where they're coming from with that. It's like I, I would let a lot of things go. But something like medicalizing or mastectomies and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Serious kind of medical decisions. I think, yeah, the parent needs to be controlling over that. But if they've been controlling all their life and that that lax parent can throw that at them, they they're in trouble. They're, they're in they're in a difficult position, really. And I think I suppose in a way that's where a kind of a real serious heart to heart of, you know what, maybe I was too over interventionist, maybe I was too controlling, maybe I did kind of overdo the academic pressure, maybe I've got everything wrong. Can you, you know that lovely line from Rumi, you know the poet, you know, beyond right doing and wrong doing, there's a field, I'll meet mm. you there. Maybe mm-hmm. you could you could on some level with your partner say, but for this, can we can we can we kind of agree on anything? With this, even if you're the most brawling couple in the world, is there something you can agree on today? Just today, yeah. can you can you get yeah. somewhere with it? Because there's a lost kid in the middle of all this who needs your attention, and you know what I mean. And even if you hate each other, you probably love your child. And and, and can you meet somewhere on this? Because it's just so important. Yeah, it's very tough. Um, what's, what's coming to my mind is our conversation with Helena. And I, it's also reminding me of other conversations I've had where, um, there might be before the gender thing even comes up, there might be some serious marital problems going on. 
And then the gender thing comes in and lo and behold, both parents continue to hold their opposite poles, the the conflict, the tension and disagree on how to handle it. So have you seen that where perhaps like the pre-existing marital difficulties are only made much, much worse by the gender thing and really highlight something that was already a major problem that had gone ignored or not addressed? I have. And this is where I feel a lot of my hope gets lost, if I'm honest, because I, I think that the there's there's a there's so many difficulties sometimes in a family that you think gender is just one of many. And honestly, you, you can't you can't put all the emphasis on gender and say this is mm-hmm. this is the problem. It's not. It's one of mm-hmm. ten problems here, and some of the mm-hmm. other problems are are huge, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's a way of avoiding the issue for the parents to go on and on and on about gender, and you say this about gender and I say that, and it's like yeah, actually, honestly, honestly, just stop talking about gender, both of you, and talk about everything else that you need to sa- you need to salvage out of this conflict ridden relationship and yeah. you know almost do an amnesty let's just not talk about gender you do whatever you want I do whatever I want for the next six months but let's not talk about gender and let's talk about other ways that we can meet in the parenting of our child because it's it's so important you know in a way like we've gone to the really dark you know the worst relationships but I do think more commonly for me I don't know about you but more commonly for me I meet the low level Mm-hmm. conflict where they disagree they disagree and they disagree but they're not quite slugging it out in the courts right and right. I, I I feel they they I feel there's a lot of loneliness in marriages like that I know I've kind of mm. suddenly veered left there but I just thought we were leaving them out in a way well because the, you know the dark the dark slugging it out is really really difficult but it's so difficult there's always other problems yeah, I mean, this kind of, it makes me want to, to say that uh, what, I often, what I often hear from families is, you know, the kid comes out and then there's an absolutely frantic, desperate search for an adolescent therapist to do individual therapy with a t- 12-year-old. And honestly, in all my years of therapy, there are very few 12-year-olds that benefit from therapy to begin with. That's my experience. I'm so, so I, glad I, you've said that. Uh, that needs to it's, be said. It's they're they're not great candidates because no. everything happening to a twelve year old is in the context of the family relationship. They're still there's, babies. There's a famous therapist in Ireland, and he says, um, "If the child is twelve or under, I'll only see the parents." Yes, yes. So, so to to kind of go back to this when when I hear about this desperate search, like. When I hear about parents thinking about putting their 12-year-old in a residential treatment program, okay, listen, sometimes maybe that's appropriate, but way more often than not, I'm like, oh no, we're totally forgetting the attachment here. So I I often tell families, what you really need to be doing is going into an attachment-based family therapy together to work through what's going on in the family. There's a dynamic and that is often much more effective and helpful than looking for an individual therapist for a child. Yeah. And, you know, by going into a family therapist, you're allowing the child the space of we have issues in our family, as opposed to you, kid, are the problem, kid. Go and sort yourself out and stop coming to this family with problems. It's, it's, mm. it's scapegoating the child for the 12 year old to go to the ch- to therapy. And for nobody else to go to therapy feels like in a 12 year old's brain, I'm the mess up. I have it all wrong. I need to be kind of fixed. And um, when I'm fixed, uh, all the family will be happy. It's, It's a very it's a deeply inappropriate message. While the family therapy concept is we have things a little bit wrong in the way we're communicating. We're behaving a little bit askew here. We're all trying to fix things. It's like we're all in the boat together. We're all taking the water yeah. out of the boat because the water's got in. And it's a, it's a teamwork. It's it's warmer. It's more um, 
everything about that is better. And not only that, I would say that like when the child, you know, and I've I've met these kids and sometimes I've gone out and it's not only 12 year olds, sometimes it's a 14 year old, especially if it's a boy and they're just not emotionally in tune enough for therapy. And I've met them thinking, lovely kid, gorgeous, not a chance could I do therapy with this kid. It's, it's not, they're, they're not there emotionally, if you follow me. They're not emotionally mature enough. And I don't want to say that in a dismissive way, but it's just not where they're at. Yeah, and completely. so when you meet them, I think they find the whole process so alienating and shocking and weird that they're like, yeah. what, what is this? And I think that can be very damaging. And it would be more appropriate in that context for the parents to go together to a therapist. And even if they, if they can't get family therapists to go as a therapist to the parents to go to see what can we do about writing the conflict yes. within our family like couples counseling yeah couples counseling mm-hmm. about the parenting do you know what I mean mm-hmm. that could be more mm-hmm. appropriate than let's say a 12 year old or a 14 year old depending on the kid because some of them they really don't suit it and I feel that they're they're lost in it and they're thinking yeah. I'm I'm being sent here because I'm a bit all over the place and I'm not even sure why and uh, right, I'll just say things to kind of go through the motions here, and it's just it doesn't work. Yeah, it's, and and it's interesting because there's this trend right now amongst youth, especially in certain online spaces, where looking for the medical or the mental health diagnosis has become really popular. And it's it's interesting because when a kid comes out as trans and the parents drop everything and say, oh God, we need to find you a therapist. It almost validates the idea that there's something pathological with the child. Yeah. Um, and it, it also diminishes the, the possibility for an awareness that we all exist in the context of a family. So Whether you're a great family or a very challenged family, if your child has problems, I promise you, there's something about the relationship and the dynamic within the family that is contributing. And that's not to say that you are terrible or you've done something bad, but it's that all human beings are flawed and that we all exist in some kind of relational context. So it's very important for if you do enlist a therapist's help, or if you're thinking through this with your child that you remember, you know, we all impact each other because that's what happens when you care about someone and you're in a relationship with someone. And so it's very, it's very crucial for the family to become kind of a little self-aware of its patterns so that the child doesn't take on this very self-absorbed burden of figuring out what's wrong with herself or himself and it's letting the family off the hook when that 12 or 14 year old goes to therapy is sent to therapy it's letting all the rest of them off the hook the kind of the conflict with the sibling the the you know what I mean the the one parent working too much the other parent losing the head too much I'm describing my own family (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know what I mean? It lets everybody <laughs> off the hook as one kid goes. And like I said, it pathologizes the child and it makes the child the child's problem and it makes the child feel that the burden is on them. And I do think it's so much more generous to not immediately seek a therapist and to kind of say, OK, um, let's have a look at what's going on within us. We are a universe in our household. And we need to have a look at what's going on with us to the point that like when people and they do every single day of my life, email me looking for a therapist. <laughs> I, I, I am fully booked anyway, but I, I write them back this kind of kind of pro forma letter where I say that really this rush to send the child to therapy mightn't be the best thing. And I suggest quite kind of heavily that they should join something like the GDSN where there's support meetings for parents where they can kind of start to learn about the world and think about their life as opposed to child you're mad go to therapy you know what I mean because and as well as that not only does it pathologize it convinces the child that there's something profoundly wrong with them and they can start very often uh, a, a cascade of going to the right therapist, looking for the right therapist. And they go from this therapist to the next therapist, always thinking the right therapist, which is externalizing the problem 
rather than realising actually the problem is within us and we can, we the family can get it better. Nancy Tucker wrote a great book um, about um, her own an- uh, her own anorexia. It's called, that was when people started to worry, I think it's called. But it's a brilliant book. No, it's called The Time In Between. And it's a book about her account of uh, anorexia. And she talks about the right therapist. And she went to this therapist, that therapist, the other therapist. And once you're starting to go down that language, and I do know that our our industry haven't covered themselves in glory. There's been a huge amount of massive difficulty with the therapists. And because there has been so much difficulty with the parents, with the therapists, I would say back the hell off out of our industry. Learn about it and attend to your family. You know, previous to 150 years ago or 100 years ago, there was no therapist. There was certainly no therapist for for teenagers. And families kind of have to kind of grapple with the human condition. And I know that's not ideal, but it's better than externalizing the problem. I agree so much. I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, what the hell did people do for the entire history of humankind when each 15-year-old didn't have their own weekly therapist? I mean, how did people survive? (laughs) You know what I mean? And I, I know it's a bit ironic. Obviously, we're both therapists. But I have, over the years I've been doing this work, I have really moved much, much more in the direction of family coaching and parent coaching, because I found that to be much more valuable. And when I think about success stories and stories where a young person is doing well, and sometimes this involves desistance and detransition and sometimes not, it's like um, the relationships with the family are far more important than anything a therapist can say to a child in the context of session. And I make, um, so I have this parent coaching membership site that I run. And I do these Q and A's. So parents will um, write in uh, questions, and I kind of answer them by video. And there was one mom of a desisted daughter, and she wrote this incredible, um, you know, question and answer where she, she talked about how the first couple of years, she spun her wheels looking for the perfect therapist, exactly what you're saying. And she said, you know, I had this imagination in my mind that the therapy would be like what you see in the movies and the therapist would just like say the right line and my daughter would have this like wake up moment and light bulbs would go off. And she said, you know, what I've learned from following Sasha's work is that therapists cannot substitute the parent. Never. And so the work is really the parent's work to do. And you know, back to our topic for the day, the same is true for that relationship, that marital relationship, which is the foundation of your family. And so if you are in a couple where you're still together and you're kind of having that low level conflict, rather than trying to pound your husband or wife with more gender critical reading to do, I might examine, you know, what's going on between us that is making this so difficult. You might be in a really healthy marriage where you just literally have different strategies. And if that's the case, I'd feel confident that you could work together to kind of leverage each person's abilities and skills and perspectives. But if the conflict is perhaps stemming from some pre-existing difficulty in your marriage, that would be the place to start. Yeah. And that's where to kind of go to. If you and your partner don't agree, even if they're your ex-partner, they don't agree and your child um, arrives with, you know, gender related distress, that's where family therapy, counselling, some sort of level of we have conflict, deep conflict in our family. And that's where we'll go rather than sending the child off to therapy and, you know, the two parents hating each other or furious with each other or disagreeing with each other. Better that we we examine the true problems than we pretend it's all about the gender. Like I say, it feels like a shield to actually the real genuine distress that has happened in the in the family. It didn't start with gender is what I would say. And it's not going to end with gender. It's it's got it's got something else going on that needs to be addressed. And it takes real courage, real courage to do that. But I suppose, you know, what I've found, I've I've heard a lot of parents say, I'm willing to do the family therapy. 
my ex isn't willing to do the family therapy. So what are you going to do about that, Stel? <laughs> <laughs> Your name gets abbreviated when people are being sassy with you. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is really difficult because it's like, yeah. you know, that's the whole problem they're saying mm-hmm. to me. That the, 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 the other parent isn't playing ball with me. They're not putting the child first. They refuse to put the child first to the extent that they won't go to the family therapy or to some sort of conflict resolution. They will not do it. They're out. They're just doing their own thing. And I'm a passenger in this disaster show. Mm. Oof. It's so deep because I think what, what comes up sometimes from the, the cauldron of gender identity is all kinds of really um, uh, almost like existential questions like do I do I even regret having kids or did one partner pressure the other partner into becoming a parent when the other partner didn't and are they now kind of retaliating by disengaging like th- there are just so many deep rooted relational challenges that probably go far beneath the surface of what it looks like on the outside. And it, it feels taboo and it feels transgressive when when somebody says, I regret having children. And I've heard many parents say it yeah. in recent years and they feel I've caused so much damage. It, it has not worked out. It hasn't <sighs> the entire project because, you know, when you have a baby, the idea is that you're 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 it's a hope for the future, isn't it? It's a kind of like. Uh, I'm in love usually, not always, but I, I think my my way of living will be a, a positive impact on babies. And I think I think maybe us or maybe me on my own can can do something great here and can really kind of give a lot of love. And that love will manifest in a, a really lovely person. And then you hit major potholes and real deep distress and you think the entire project was misguided I shouldn't have done it none of it's worked out and now where am I and that's where you have to in my mind is where you have to go really deep and you have to go to the great philosophers you have to go as as big as you can go in what is life for what is our sense of meaning how can you get some meaning and purpose in life because you know the big project of your life hasn't worked out what do you do then? You know, what what do you salvage from this? Because you know what? Every generation since time began have faced, some parents have faced that, that it hasn't worked out. You know what I mean? Like even you go back to biblical times and Cain and Abel, you know what I mean? And Cain is a Cain mm-hmm. murdered Abel and stuff. You know what I mean? Like the, this project of parenting, not for the faint hearted. Have you seen this kind of raise up some deal breakers to where parents have gotten divorced. Um, yeah. And I don't want to say because of the gender thing, but again, because the gender thing maybe bubbled to the surface, some, some underlying issues or became such a deal breaker that it was more than the couple could handle. Maybe they were already at a rough point, but then the gender came in and just became too much. And I've, I have seen that, but I've also seen parents truly blame only the gender and I have thought really could it be could it really be and I've been told yeah no that's it that's what it was there was no more and no less and I would say there is probably more because yeah. but then I'm a little bit hesitant because then I think I do think we're in the middle of an unfolding medical scandal I do think some people they give trust to the doctors and some people don't and if your partner, if their one flaw, the one flaw you knew you were marrying them, but you knew that they tend to give their power away to those in authority. And if I, I can see how that could really just blow up in your face in, in terms of gender, if you give your power away to the authorities for gender, I can see how genuinely I can see how that could become a deal breaker in a, in a marriage. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, I feel myself also drawn to to say we're talking about scenarios in which the marriage is really put through the the ringer with the gender thing. And, you know, what I often actually see, which I find so hopeful and so amazing, is that 
there are some couples who really strengthen going through this. Just like I think I've shared before, sometimes parents will write to me when their kid's desisting or maybe their kid's in a stable place and say, you know, I feel closer to my kid now than ever before. You know, going through this gender thing woke us up to like yeah. paying more attention. Definitely. And sometimes that can happen for a couple, you know, like interestingly, there's this united mission that they have and they're working together and they're relying on each other and they're, you know, mourning together and, and crying together and also, you know, hopeful together. Going so deep. Yeah, I mean, that can be an incredibly... Uh, important experience that really deepens a marriage to go through a kind of like, you know, what they might see as a crisis together. So it's not that this gender experience only leads to this dissolution. It can lead to, you know, parents really working together and, and reining it in as a team. Yeah, I think really to kind of almost, you know, summarize where we kind of got to in this kind of wide reaching kind of discussion between the two of us about when parents disagree is along the lines of if you disagree about gender, there are probably a lot of underlying things that need to be dealt with. And the brave parents say L we might hate each other, but for our kid, let's try and find places that we can kind of work together and, and, and strategize for the child. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.